All right, welcome to the Miduele podcast. Just a short introduction and thank you to our team sponsor, Hangar 15. Grateful for them and the many years of service they've provided to us. All our thanks go out to Mike Hansen and his team up at Hangar 15 on Wasatch Boulevard. In this episode, we talked to Taylor Cannon and Janie Bowen all about their experience in the Ironman arena. Get ready to learn about some of their best and worst moments training and participating in Ironman and really kind of what makes them tick when it comes to choosing to be part of this endurance sport world. We're grateful to have them as uh, members of the Miduele team and thankful for the hour that they spend with us here sharing all their cool stories. So hope you enjoy episode seven, Miduele podcast. Thanks. All right, all right. Welcome to the Miduele podcast or Miduele after I listen to John Olson numerous times on his podcast. Miduele. I thought we were very clear about how this is pronounced. Mm, man, John. Miduele. Will you get it to us one more time? What is John. it, Miduele or Miduele? Miduele. Uh, Stuart Anderson here joined by Spencer Chipping. <clears throat> Welcome, Spencer Chipping. Uh, joined by Jake Cook. We're grabbing Jake before he travels off to Hawaii for three weeks. Wow. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Gee. Ooh, is that like the winter training program? Winter training, man. Going to get that festive 500 in Hawaii. Festive 500 calories of Snickers bars every hour. Yeah, it's going to go <laughs> great for you. Uh, we are joined by two special guests, uh, Janie Bowen and Taylor Cannon. This is our episode devoted to, I, I don't even know what we're going to call you by the time we're done iron iron men and women although idiots i mean idiots <laughs> we're cracking the <laughs> cracking the code of what it means to be an iron person uh i really am so excited this has been in the works for a couple weeks so uh okay very good um a couple announcements i'll be quick uh team camp in process for march 4th through 5th uh pfft. Fourth through seventh, there was the question of COVID tests. It is probably going to be a possibility that we're going to do some rapid tests or something before you come down, make it safe for everyone. Uh, kit pickup sometime in early February. I know we ordered POC helmets and glasses. I was connecting with the rep yesterday. He said that they are close. He's probably the same guy running the kicker orders. So uh, <laughs> the kicker guy's got the POC stuff. <laughs> And uh, they're on their way. Just kidding. I want to be sensitive to the kicker order. They are doing their best to get them to us. Uh, obviously, Wahoo's super backed up, but uh, things are, are moving there. So any anything else, Jake, Chip? No, I think you got it. Janie, Tay, why don't you say something like, well, I don't know Welcome. what you say. What do you say? Speak up. It's just good to be guys. I'm so impressed with the intro. You've got it down. Oh, it's going to get, wait, just wait for this bio, your wife wrote. It is good. I'm sorry. I had to edit it. It was just a bunch of malarkey. <laughs> you read it? Oh, I really wanted to surprise you. <laughs> Thank I you. should read you the first one she sent. It's so good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta just, I'm going to start with it. Taylor was born in 1983, and he met the most amazing person in the world in junior high. And he's been smitten ever since. He married his dream girl, and that's all he cares about now. He wakes up daily and thinks, how can I serve my beautiful wife? Oh, and sometimes he likes to bike. That's so awesome. There it is, man. Like, I, I'm all about servicing my loved ones. So. <laughs> Dude, <that's> no. <laughs> shout, out to, shout out to Carrie. That was so good. Okay. Uh, so as an intro to what we wanted to talk about, these two... Uh, have an interesting background in endurance sports, whether it's training or mindset or philosophy or the ability to balance. We want to talk about all those things that revolve around this idea of accomplishing an Ironman, transitioning into biking, balancing family, balancing training, indoor riding, outdoor riding, skills behind all the sports. I mean, I just kind of want to spend the time. Can we do that? Can we talk about all this? Let's have fun. Man. Yes. Okay. I'll introduce Taylor. And uh, then Jake is going to introduce Janie. Taylor was born in 1983, Holiday, Utah, and attended Olympus. Graduated in 2001, then served a mission to Russia. Yeah. Uh, married his high school sweetheart in 2005, then graduated from the U of U with a political science degree. Same. 
Dude, who, who talked us into that? What a terrible idiots. <laughs> idiots. Idiot. Best degree ever. Then he got a master's degree in uh, healthcare administration from the Mi University of Minnesota. In 2009, uh, Tay and his wife started their family with. So I, I'm not quite sure, Tay, is it a set of. Your, your twins are a boy and a girl. Yes. Okay. Boy, boy. boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. They now have four kids, ages six through 11, two boys and uh, two girls. He's been working at the ho as a hospital administrator as the senior director of business development for the University of Utah Hospital. Seven years. That's pretty awesome. When he's not training, super involved dad, which is what we love to hear, always coaching his kids basketball, soccer, and watching his daughters at dance. Uh, very active in sports, which I knew that growing up, played high school football, basketball, and rugby at the U of U. You actually played rug like on the team. I think so. I mean, they let me play for a little bit. You wore the short shorts, Tay? <laughs> the short shorts are back in style. Even basketball players uh, are in short shorts, right? I'd say they, they never left. Did you get the weird ears? <laughs> no, I didn't wrestle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh he turned to running after he got married ran his first marathon in 2006 and has run over 20 marathons Dang. is that is that real life that's stupid wow. that's really stupid he's qualified for the boston marathon uh multiple times and ran boston in 2015 fastest marathon a 252 in saint george <laughs> in 2016 holy shit uh ran two ultras 50 milers and then decided to move on to different goals <laughs> turned, turned iron man in 2011 with saint george full uh then he's done so five iron mans and eight 70.3s is oh. that right i think so yeah okay so then uh, your wife, hurt. your wife writes. Then he realized how much you love biking uh, from doing Ironman, and has turned his focus there uh, and other and other dumb adventures. <laughs> <laughs> I edited that. I, I thought I was just too serious. Uh, that's funny, dude. <laughs> uh, so three lo three loadages. And my, I'm gonna just say my favorite thing about Tay is uh, he's not on social media, like doesn't exist. But his wife posts many pictures of him. He is never not wearing Miduele suit. Uh huh. It's, it's always very on. Very true. Very true. <laughs> that's hey. my that's my favorite part. Rep the MD, brother. Rep. Yeah. Yep. Nice. All right, JD, you're up. Oh me? <laughs> yeah, Let's go. go. Jake. Okay. Well, uh, better known in our house is Janie Goggins, I guess. Right. Janie this is a, your your beloved husband wrote this, which is fantastic. <laughs> By the way, Brandon is a, such a rad dude. Yeah. Um, anyways, but, uh, at the age of five, Jenny was diagnosed with a vision robbing an autoimmune eye disease that has led to six eye surgeries, including a lens replacement in her right eye. She has received steroid injections straight into her eyes more than 100 times. Oh my God. At the age of 13, she was involved in a terrible boating accident requiring her to be life lighted from Lake Powell. That's crazy. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, she had pins in her, in her hip uh, to fix a spiral fracture in her femur. She had her hip replaced at the age of 20 because of necrosis. Is that how you say it? Necrosis. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Poor Brandon made this wordy for you. <laughs> Coming from his doctor background, right? Uh, from her femur fracture, Janie didn't allow her health struggles to define her life. In high school, she excelled in swimming, winning 200 IM 5A state championship. Janie started doing triathlons. In 2017, started with a half Ironman in Santa Cruz. She had since completed three full Ironman races, as well as countless half Ironman races. She's raced and podiumed her first Lodija after joining the team in 2019. Incredible feat. Uh, she worked for six years as a nurse, primary, uh, primarily in the pediatric ER, adult ER, pediatric ICU, and NICU. She then went back to school and became a women's health nurse, practitioner, and nurse midwife. And in September, she gave birth, I guess, unmedicated, which is powerful, uh, to her beautiful baby, Blue. So, um, rad yeah. story, Janie. Janie, Janie I, I didn't can't know, wait to I hear about not, I did not know that about your eyeballs. That is wild. Yeah, yeah it's, it's <clears throat> interesting. I can't believe you've never crashed the group before. 
That's awesome. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear about you finishing the Ironman on a freaking broken foot. Oh, my God. oh no, is my bro. No, 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 no. When I joined your team, I had a broken foot. Okay. Oh. And Iron Man, I broke my leg. <laughs> okay. Dang. So uh, I kind of want to explore. I'll do Tay first and then Janie, you can go. I want to hear the introduction on how you decided uh, ultra endurance sports, Iron Man, what, whatever like got you in. I want to know the story behind. I'm going to do this. Go ahead, Tay. Oh, man. Yeah. So I think everyone here has seen the Iron Man on NBC, right? Like that guy's voice just makes it seem like it's the coolest event ever. And they make it just seem so amazing. Um, so I think like, I, I, I remember watching that and, uh, you know, I'd been running quite a bit and I saw like the win winning time and it was like a, a 250 marathon. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I thought I could do a 250 marathon in 90 degrees and 70% humidity in Kona, but I was like, I could probably like do okay at that. And so I, uh, I didn't have a bike and I signed up <laughs> for St. <Saint> George. <laughs> <laughs> Never swam in, in my life. Just thought I could, I used to do a paper out as a kid. So I was like, I can ride a bike oh my and then I think I can run. So <laughs> I just signed up and started training and so hopefully like the, the takeaway from anything that I say today is like George Costanza. And when he does like do the opposite of George, like everyone should do the opposite of me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have made so many mistakes. Uh, but anyways, did my first one in St. George, had a great time, just ultimately cut the bug. And uh, not until recently have I, not been as obsessed with it, but uh, it was a fun ride there for a bit. Nice. So. Okay, Janie, how about you? So Taylor, you just went straight for the full. No <laughs> half, just straight for the full. I didn't do, no, I didn't even do like a, a sprint or a Olympic. <laughs> <laughs> what a savage. <laughs> George Costanza, Janie, George Costanza. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, I got into it um, and I'm gonna put this very bluntly because I had people telling me that I could never do it. And that just lit a fire inside of me. Um, my sister and her fiance were doing the half iron man in Santa Cruz. And I just kept saying like, Oh man, I'm so bummed. I wish I could do something like that. Cause I had not run since I broke my hip. Um, I did not bike and I swam in a pool every once in a while since high school. And my mom basically was like, yeah, you're just, you're never going to be able to do that. And you just need to accept it. And I stewed for days and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for it and see what happens. And I crossed that finish line at Santa Cruz and it changed my life for forever. It changed everything about me and was one of the most defining moments. And I just wanted more and more and more and kept going after it. So rad. that, that really answered my next question, which I'll, I'll ask to Tay. Um, like what were you seeking to, uh, in doing this? Like, were you looking for something? Yeah. I mean, I think when, when you, when you leave college and you're not really sure what else to do with yourself besides find a job and take care of your kids, you need some kind of outlet. And I've just always been a competitive person. And so just got into it and was just kind of seeking to similar to what Janie said, just wanted to prove to myself that I could do something really challenging and I think Janie's exactly right. Like when you, when you cross the finish line of an Ironman and Bill Riley says, <laughs> you are an Ironman, like, the, like it, it is the most amazing experience. And that sounds very cliche and, and kind of lame, but unlike doing Lota Joe, where there's like a few people on the side, there's like hundreds of people lined up. It's starting to get dark. People are zombies, like crawling across the finish line. And when you cross that finish line, there's like, there's no better finish line in endurance sports than an Ironman. So I think I was at first definitely kind of seeking that experience. And then it just turned into, you know, how fast can I go? So um, I think maybe to give a little more background here behind Janie's story, Janie, um, could you expound on your autoimmune disease and your, and your leg, uh, just so 
I mean, yeah. I think it's part, I think it's a good part of the story to hear why people would have assumed that you couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I felt like, honestly, I, I related so much to John Olson's podcast. Like, it's like, <laughs> who is this guy? He's my soulmate. Like, maybe <laughs> we're just a broken pair. But um, yeah, so I just, I failed my kindergarten eye exam when I was five. And my mom said she even like started crying, being like, oh, she's going to have to wear glasses. This is going to be terrible. And brought me to the eye doctor and they were like, whoa, you have to take her up to see a specialist right away. Wow. Um, so that's when I started doing um, injections into my eyes. So I was diagnosed with an autoimmune eye disease called pars planitis, which basically just robs your vision. So I've had multiple instances where I've woken up and been completely blind for weeks so you and literally inject like stuff in your eyes. Yeah. So, um, so since I was five, I get routine injections straight into my eyeballs. Um, I've gotten a few steroid implants put in required multiple surgeries. So that was like my big thing. And then I broke my hip in like Powell in a kite tubing accident. Oh. We were there for 30 minutes and I just annihilated my hip and was life lighted. Um, but getting from Lake Powell up to primary children's hospital does not take a short amount of time. So basically I lost all the blood supply to that bone and they knew I was going to have to get replaced. Um, but that caused my autoimmune disease to flare up. So there was like a period in eighth grade where I was, I had braces. I was in a wheelchair for three months. I had an eye patch. (laughs) It was just a rough time. Um, but yeah, so I kind of, Um, I had to get another surgery from my hip, multiple other eye surgeries. So winning that state championship in high school was just like the coolest thing ever. Cause it was just, I felt like this big comeback story and basically had just said like, that was it for me. Like I will never be running since I broke my hip. I didn't even own a bike. And so I'll just do yoga and get into that. And, um, rightfully so my parents are just very anxious about my my health and well being. Um, so they definitely did not, they were not supportive of me doing this Ironman race. And uh-huh. even before I signed up for Ironman Texas, I did not tell them that I signed up for it, which was my first full. And my dad actually wrote me a thousand dollar check and said, please don't do this. Because wow. they thought I was just going to hurt myself. And I was like, oh, this just makes me want to do it more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So you guys have been around a lot of, uh, endurance athletes. And I think that just even Tay doing the ultras, like in your opinion, what makes even the cycle team, what makes this group of people that you've been around tick? Like what, what is it about this thing that, uh, from a sports psychology standpoint makes people get into this stuff? Yeah, it's an awesome question. I I think everyone probably on the team has had someone ask them that question. Like, why, why are you doing that? Like when we're talking about Clark Davis before the podcast, why why is he on Zwift for 12 hours? Like it's a hard, it's a hard question to really answer. Um, I I think the thing that at least motivates me is, um, a good network of dudes and and gals. So we want to make sure I include Janie and other females on the team because they're just as just as motivated and just as passionate about it. But um, I've had two really great friends who I've done just really stupid stuff with for a long time, and that's Jake Anderson and Zach West. I mean, we have done some of the dumbest stuff together, but everyone knows how you feel after an endurance ride, right? Like after Lodija, like when you take that right turn to finish Lodija, you're like, this, I'm never doing this race. <laughs> like ever again. And then when you're done, it's like, you're hugging everyone. You're like, you're in tears. And I, I think we all kind of chase that in, in the process of perfecting, um, perfecting ourselves through training is, is something that I think keeps us, keeps us grounded, keeps us motivated, keeps life in perspective. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would say. would love to hear what, what Janie says too. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, I think when I first started it, you know, getting into this endurance world, I thought that these people that were doing all these races were completely supernatural, that they were just blessed with certain gifts that I just did not possess. And so I kind of put these people on a pedestal and said that like, it's okay. I just am not one of those people. 
And I think once you get into that world, it's just, it's something that you can't explain, which I think makes us all so much closer is that you can't, you know, for someone on the outside, they have no idea why you do these things. And they think you're absolutely insane for doing it. But when you're in that group of people that have this mutual respect for the sport and they basically are all just driven to be better, to do better, to do things that they didn't think are possible. I think it just bonds all of you. And I think that's kind of the point of this is that people that do endurance sports are all striving to just be better and to accomplish these crazy goals that they have. And it just brings everyone a lot closer. I love that. I agree. Uh, I used to race triathlons with Kristen before I got into biking and, um, just that sense of community inside that group. It is an interesting group to be with. Um, I feel like this team kind of shares that feelings of camaraderie and, and encouragement as you used to feel inside that funny transition zone where everyone is like rallying around each other to, to do your best as an individual inside that sport. So that's cool. Very good. Hey, hey Stuart, I think the one thing that's interesting about the stories and you, and you hear these stories um, of these two and, and there is a common theme and that is just sheer grit. And it starts when they were told no, <laughs> and then they make it to the event and the event essentially tells you, no, you have a, <clears throat> perhaps a, an ailment or a broken foot, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in Janie's, in Janie's case. <clears throat> so, and so would you guys say that an Ironman, Janie mentioned, are they all just supernatural and I'll never be one of those people? Well, no, it is, uh, it is the grit inside the person that becomes the Ironman. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Janie, Tay? It is in- I agree with you. I mean, and it's something that I think is inside of people, but it's, it's incredible. I think if you do show up to any of these races and I'm sure Taylor agrees is that it attracts all different types of people that you wouldn't necessarily look at and be like, Oh, you do Ironmans or, you know, anything like that. But I think just to show up and see that, like what people are able to accomplish when they, you know, just dig deep and work really hard for a long time, what they're capable of. But that grit part is like perfect. Well said. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Chip and, and Janie. I think um, when you show up to an Ironman and you're all standing in like penguin wetsuits and you're looking at each other's bodies, like there's, you can't help but compare yourself to the person next to you, right? Like <laughs> one person is just like, just like, you're like, you're like, that guy is going to like destroy me, you know? And then you look to your left and it's like, that person's not going to finish no way in heck. And I, I think that's, what's so awesome about just the endurance community is it's not necessarily time or a PR that motivates everyone. It's exactly what Chip said. It's, it's proving to yourself that the, that you're worth something that you can accomplish something. And so it's, it's a very tangible experience that gives you confidence in, in all aspects of life. So um, it's, what, how did you say it, Chip? You said it's the Iron Man. I can't even say it. The, was grit, the grit inside. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That, that's it right there. That so awesome. that was deep, Chip. That was really deep. Oh. Very deep. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. Who's up? Okay. So we're going to move into, um, we kind of want to talk about uh, some stories. Uh, I, I really love hearing stories and, and maybe Jake can take the lead on this discussion here on, on asking these two about, uh, some of their good experience, bad experiences. Um, so go ahead, Jake. Yeah, let's roll. Um, so obviously, you know, each of you guys, you know, spend both your time riding bikes a lot and, uh, you know, with all your endurance events, we want to hear obviously the worst, the good and the bad. So, um, let's start with you, Tay. Um, give us the worst and give us the bad. I mean, I can share, my little two cents, but I'll save it for later. But let's see. Let's I hear your side. Take Iron Man story. <laughs> no, I do. Oh, absolutely, dude. I I love listening. Um, oh gosh, I've had like I said, like I think that's why I'm so grateful for the community of, of people that we have with me dwelling now is because 
I, I get so many questions about what should I do? And I just like, did not have that. You know, when I first signed up, I literally like had no idea what I was doing. So if you want like the worst experience, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about Tahoe Ironman in uh, 2016. Um, so <laughs> I went out there with Jake Anderson and it snowed the night before. So like in Truckee Pass, like we're getting these pictures, the snow plow is like pushing snow off the road. We show up the next morning, like there's icicles on my bike. Um, But that, like those pictures of Lake Tahoe with the steam coming off the lake was like the coolest experience ever though. So anyways, I did the whole bike with a North Face fleece jacket on. So that was amazing. (laughs) So you thought you think leg warmers so arrow in the community. <laughs> you think like leg warmers are bad. No, try like a fleece jacket, like oh, in the wind, right? We'll, we'll get to the leg warmers, Tay. Don't worry. We'll get to the leg warmers for loads of this year. Yeah. So it was it was so cold, like I, I had I ate uh I took one bite, and again, this is like do the opposite of Taylor, right? Like I'm not hungry. I had one bite of a power bar. And it was like frozen. And it's like, have you ever eaten a big hunk that like you chew? I like took one bite and I was like, no way. And I just chucked it. Like I I didn't even, I had one bite of a power bar. And then like, I I didn't go through one bottle of water. So like I get through, I think I got through the bike pretty decent. I, it had 7,000 feet of climbing and I have to tell this story. So we're going up this hill and this, all of a sudden I hear this like, I'm like, what? I look over and it's this guy. He's like, oh, thank you. He was so grateful to have a flat tire so he didn't have to st- keep pedaling. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was like the funniest thing I've ever heard. But anyways, I got through the bike. I think the average bike time for Lake Tahoe Ironman was like 6.45. I don't so, care about like, the bike. I want to hear about the swim. If it was snowing, I want to hear about the swim. Oh, that, that was probably the only time he was warm that day. Yeah, that was, that was like the oh. best part of the race, Jake. That was amazing. So anyways, I started running and like mile eight, I just, I was like, I'm, I'm so sick. I, I just started like dry heaving and throwing up and then just started to kind of walk. And anyways, got to the end. It was not a great finish. Um, Jake Anderson's in-laws were there and like took us home. And I had to tell them six times to pull over because I was vomiting like out of their nice car. <laughs> it, was so, it was so horrible. But I think that one was one of the ones I was most proud of because like literally you're talking three hours of just on that run where I literally was in one of the darkest places. But uh, yeah, that was probably my worst Iron Man by far. <laughs> from an Ooh, great, dude. Janie, what, cra- Janie, what about you? It is crazy though, Jay. Oh, sorry, uh, no, I mean, it's like what John said about point to point last week though, is that the best is usually the worst or, Amen. you know, his worst is usually his best. That's the one he loves the most. I just so. can't imagine doing that. Oh, not I'm Janie shaking her head. Janie's not as dumb as me. She's hey, like, Jamie. Hey, hey, sure. oh no, I'm pretty dumb too. <laughs> dumb, dumb. I just wouldn't say that it's my best. <laughs> you, you did have a similar experience though, because Louisville, wasn't it? Wasn't it freezing in Louisville? Oh, it was blowing rain sideways all day. I think the high was like 41. So when we started the swim, it was like 33 and they kept delaying the swim. So we were just standing barefoot and they took all our gear. Oh, that was terrible. And yeah, I had cuts around my leg where my tri kit was on my thigh and I have scars from that, but that was not, that was not the worst. Let's hear the worst. Let's get to um, it. You guys all know about Arizona this last year, which was just, well, it's heartbreaking. I'm going to tell two worst. One, quickly, when you guys met me at Tour of St. George, I had my broken foot. So I went on a, I did a brick of a bike run and ended up breaking my foot in three places. Showed up, um, did Tour of St. George because it didn't hurt to bike too much. That's when I met you guys. But then I was supposed to do Ironman St. George. And, um, it was the half. So I did the swim in the bike and I came into T2 and I had snuck my walking boot into my T2 bag. <laughs> and I was like, so determined that I was just going to walk the run. Cause I just wanted to finish. Like I was, I didn't want to just do the swim in the bike, which is what my coach told me to do, which is what Brandon told me to do. Cause I got off when I was in second and I was just like, 
I can do this. So I start getting my boot and Brandon comes and sees me and he's like, absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to put my boot on and I didn't get a finish St. George, which was what the plan was, but that was just like killed me inside. But Uh far worse was Ironman Arizona this last November. Um, just trained super hard with you guys all summer on the bike and put in so much work was coming off the broken foot, but my run was getting back to it. And my coach was like super confident that we could get me in a good spot to like possibly qualify for Kona. Like we could do this. And so I did the swim and the bike and the bike was just the time of my life, like just crushed and had the best time and came off the bike in first place by over 15 minutes. Let's go. So it's like, sweet, I'm golden. Like we can do this and started running first three miles felt so awesome. And then at mile three of the run, mind you, the run is 26.2 miles. Mm. <laughs> I just feel this like pop in my right lower leg and just so much pain instantly. And I'm like, okay, I didn't trip. I didn't do anything, which is where the Jane Goggins comes from, because my assignment was to listen to can't hurt me. So I am like, don't be a sissy. It doesn't hurt that bad. Like just in my head, the whole run. And I look terrible. Like the videos. I remember seeing the pictures pictures on Instagram. A special form of torture to watch that. And so I finished that race (laughs) barely. I don't know how I did that. And even like that night had terrible compartment syndrome in my leg. Like I just woke up screaming in the middle of the night and it turns out I broke my fibula all the way through. Look at Taylor. <laughs> so I still podiumed and I got fifth, but it was oh so God. sad to just like watch that slip away the whole time. It was one of those like great. I finished type. If you would if you would have more, if you would have wore more compression socks, it probably wouldn't have. <laughs> That's what I did wrong. <laughs> oh, Dude, anyway. that's amazing though fifth place like that's like people don't realize how competitive iron right. men are people come from all over the world to go to races like oh. they're international races and so to finish that high on a freaking broken leg <laughs> it's pretty incredible you, you remember like you know i've always i'm visioning right now like the finishing of kona watching those people who come in at like midnight and they are like crawling to get the i mean these endurance athletes, they are doing whatever they can to finish. And I just, I mean, thinking of Janie, thinking of you, Taylor, even two in the cold, just trying to finish. I mean, that's, I just think that's such a unique part about the sports is just, you want to finish, you know, these people have a huge drive to finish. So, but, and, and Janie, just moving on to, uh, you, you spoke about your coach. I know that Taylor uses trainer road um, for kind of his training, but, uh, and we'll get to that. We'll ask him a question about that, but Janie, you have this special training plan that you use with with coach Randy, he's in La- out of Las Vegas, right? Or he was, maybe he moved, but um, can you just tell us a little, little just a brief um, little intro about, or uh, uh, explanation about how you use coach Randy's training plan? Yeah. Um, so he started coaching me when I was, um, I think, I think it was my, there's a couple, maybe like a year into my Ironman racing and stuff. And he was the, um, triathlon coach at our local bike shop in Las Vegas pro cyclery. Um, and he actually, you know, he's, he's just the nicest dude. And he brought me into this group of riders and he was just, he believed in me so much. And he even offered just to coach me for free. Like he was just like, let me just, let me coach you just see how you like it. And so basically he just uploads all my workouts into training peaks. Um, so I have my FTP test that I do and he based all my bike workouts off of that. And then he'll do swim workouts and run workouts, obviously. Uh, but the bike workouts are absolutely killer. And so I think when I started with Randy, from the time I started with Randy up to Ironman, Arizona, my FTP had increased 54 Watts. That's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's awesome. And it's, he's one of the, few people that I think just has so much just unwavering faith in like my abilities, like even more so than me, like he just will do anything to help me. And I'm forever grateful for that. 
nothing I love more than than popping on Strava and seeing all those zigzag marks on your uh, daily <laughs> this, rides. This <laughs> week, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> just for you. Uh, Taylor, what about you, man? I know you use Trainer Road, and I, I, you know, I know there's some people on the team that use Trainer Road, but I mean, I've tried it once, and I just didn't like it. it wasn't my cup of tea. But how does how does that how has that helped you or, or you know with your your base plan or, or your um, you know your endurance um, style? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I first started getting into Ironman, at least I, I had zero structure. I, I remember like the first long ride I did in my trainer was five hours in my garage. And I was like, I have, I have no idea how hard to pedal, you know? And then like, I would watch ESPN and I'm like, I'm going to pedal hard during the commercials. And then I'm going to go back to like, it was just stupid. Right. And so when I found out about trainer road and I started listening to the podcast, my, my fr first FTP um, was 240. And I thought like I was a really good cyclist, like going into that, like, I'm so good. Like, <laughs> so, I, so I hit 240. Uh, I've now done 570. I looked it up before the podcast because I knew it was just stupid, but I've done 576 rides on Trainer Road. Um, and my FTP has increased by over 100 since that first oh, FTP test. That's incredible. But, that's just like, it, it was just a simple way for me to really get structure and, and, and kind of have a plan. Like if you don't have a plan, you just start pedaling on your trainer, you show up, you run, you know, I think I need to run 20 miles. I think I need to swim 2.4, but you just don't re really see improvement that way. So I think trainer Rose just brought me a lot of clarity. You guys, just before with you real quick, last question. Do you, do you getting into this kind of sport? do you need structure like a structure plan like this to really get into the sport or can you kind of just freelance it in a sense? You don't have to have structure. It just makes a world of a difference, I think, in your experience. And because I think Taylor's right. Like if you, it takes so much guts just to sign up for a race that you think that you can prepare for, because at that exact moment, there's no way that you can finish a full Ironman. Right. So you're signing up thinking that you're going to, you know, be at a place that you could finish. Um, and when I started, I was looking up people that were signed up for the same Ironman race as me that was, that were like, they were posting on Instagram what they were doing that day. So I would just copy them. Right. And so I don't think you, you have to do it if it's like a cost thing, but it is definitely the best investment. I think if you're going to get into the sport and really get into it, having a coach or some structure is key. It's good feedback. Mm. It's really good. Um, you Hold know, so, Oh, go ahead, Chip. No. Yeah. You go, you got to see. I just, I wanted, before we moved on, I really, I really like this question that I don't know who wrote this down, but it says in what in your eyes makes an event successful. And I think each of us can answer that question. It doesn't have to just be these iron men. Like how do you walk away from a thing and be like, dang, I, I'm happy with this. I'm not, I mean, it really is an interesting sports psychology question to deal. How do you define success? Uh, maybe we'll start with Janie and then Tay. And then if Chip and Jake wanted to chime in, I think it's an interesting thought. Yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think kind of echoing what Taylor said, it depends on the conditions of race day, to be honest. Um, but for the most part, like for me, success in a, in a race is like mostly when you're getting into these big endurance races, did I finish and did I have a good time? Did I enjoy that? Um, and then Arizona was the first time that I was really trying to go for like a position or a time. Um, but for me, it was just doing something that I felt like was impossible. And so finishing was a success because especially when you're going to races like Louisville or in Tahoe where the dropout rate is probably 30%. Um, you feel like it's a huge victory just to be able to kind of endure and finish. Nice. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I think so many of us get fixated on times with races. Like how many times have we heard someone say, I want to go sub 10 at Lodija or I want to go sub 10 at an iron. Right. Like that's always in people's, the back of their mind. And all of my favorite races haven't been about time. They've all been about just 
did I get my best performance on that day? And, um, you know, just, just to make it real life. I mean, I think in 2012, St. George Ironman was like the windy wave year. I don't know if you guys remember that or saw the, but I remember like swimming and all of a sudden I was pissed because I thought there was some boat like doing waves around the swimmers. (laughs) Turns out like it's a freaking windstorm. And I remember like all these people started jumping on the boat, like, I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. And if you look, if you looked on the sand hollow Island, it looked like there was a bunch of penguins on the Island. Cause there, everyone was just standing there. And this guy is like yelling at me like, Hey, get in the boat, get in the boat. You're going to die. And I'm like, and I remember I put my hands like on the boat to get in. And I'm like, I've been trained for this freaking event for like <laughs> six months. Like F no. Like I, and I just like kept swimming. <laughs> so like got out of the water. It's like the wind, like everyone's ridden in St. George, the veil loop, like just like 90 degree blow dryer in your face. Everyone is super like, this sucks. Why are we here? And I'm just like, I'm just so grateful to be here and suffering like throughout the day. Like I just tried to keep it positive and then got off the bike. The bike time was horrendous got to the run and I'm the wind started to die down. I still felt great. And I ran a 340 marathon off the bike. And it was just like, it, it was the best race because I think I just kept a positive mindset, kept mm-hmm. going. And it wasn't my best time, but it was like, it's all about attitude. It's all about just what you put into it. And that's, that's how I would define success. It's, it's not about time. It's just about your best effort. So, okay. Um, Stu, I want to add to this, and I will mention what I feel um, makes an, an event a great event, and that's the people, the participants that are in the event. And what I mean by that is when you take a, a road bike race, I would say that participants are all kind of hard asses. If you <laughs> were to go to a mountain bike race, uh, there's beer at the end, and there is maybe even some beer at the feed zones. When you go to a cross race, it's somewhere in between there. But now let's go to an Ironman event where those people have, um, as we have talked about, um, a lot more to prove to themselves, to their families, to everybody, to everything, what they are about to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I just feel that an Ironman event, and that is why the road is lined by hundreds of people um, because of what they are accomplishing. Money. Well said. Um, My, if anyone cares, I mean, for me, uh, I try to manage the success of the event that I believe it takes place before the event. So um, I believe that everything that revolves around game day is, um, I just think whatever can happen that day. Um, I love everything that I become because of what the event inspires me to do. That is for what, in my eyes, what makes an event successful, which is why I love the ones that I get involved with is because of the, the preparation, the people, the places, the feelings I have of what that event inspires before I go. Um, I just, that to me is like uh, only because I've had events that are just terrible. And so I'm like, I cannot put all of my gratitude and thankfulness and everything on this one day. It has to revolve around what this one day has made me become before I got here. So anyway, that, that to me is kind of how I look at the success of the day. Jake thoughts on that? No, no. I mean, I, I agree with everything that said, I think, uh, you know, define the impossible. I mean, I think that's the kind of common theme here with, with these two endurance athletes is, you know, I think defining success for me is defining that impossible, make like pushing your body to the limit. And if you come away with, you know, feeling like you've pushed your body to the limit and done everything you can, I think that's success, you know? So. Nice. All right, Chip, you want to bring us in for a yeah, uh, ending here? We got some. Sure. Okay. You know, um, Correct me if I am wrong, Janie and Tay, but some would argue that those training for an Ironman, that it is 
almost even selfish based on the amount of time that you could put into it. But let me just throw a bone to endurance athletes and these two in particular and follow it up with a question because when you read these bios and what they have accomplished outside of the Ironman accomplishments and the race results, you would learn that they have been able to apply what they have gained through their grit and training to life. And so Jeannie, you first, what have you applied to, to your life through everything you have done through out learning and training for Ironman and suffering? Yeah. Uh, I love that question, Chip. That's a really great question. Um, when I first started into Ironman, I was very fortunate that, you know, I was able to kind of live in a selfish world. Um, we were in Las Vegas and I was working full time supporting my husband through dental school and doing this half Ironman initially, and then doing a full Ironman, like something that truly in my heart, I never thought I was capable of doing and crossing that finish line and having this absolutely life-changing moment. Like literally I was a, I came away from those races, a completely different person. And it motivated me to be like, well, I've never thought about going back to school. Like if I'm capable of doing this race and doing something that I felt like was impossible, I am so, I am capable of so much more. So as soon as I got done with Ironman Santa Cruz, I applied to grad school and I, it basically forced me into a world of waking up at 4 a.m. every day to train. I would go work a 13 hour ER shift. I would go train again and then do homework until 11 o'clock and then get up at 4 a.m. And I did that seven days a week for years when we were living in Vegas. Um, but it, it made me, it just made me so much more confident in what I was capable of. And, you know, that helped me in my you know, own self-confidence, obviously, but in my relationships and in my education and being able to juggle everything. And I'll always apply, you know, all this, all these learning opportunities to my life. But I would say it just gave me this confidence that, you know, no one can make, give you, I had to find it myself and it completely changed me. And I will, I will never be the same because of that. And I'm grateful for that because it's going to make me a better athlete. It's going to make me a better provider and a better mom. And, you know, just having a baby now, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes out and how I can juggle everything, but it's just going to be something that will come with time, I guess. But I'm grateful that me duly is, or Dwelly, I'm so sorry. <laughs> John Olson got my head. <laughs> you know, I love that everyone has families and they juggle all the same things and I'm going to learn so much from them. And I love that you guys go at 4 a.m. because that's the time that works. Yeah. I, I often tell my wife, I justify it by saying I, I could be really into video games and spending hours uh, sitting in front of the TV, right? Can you could guys you play, imagine? Could you play video games whilst doing Trainer Road? <laughs> no. Hey, okay. hey Tay, let me watch his news stories while he's on Zwift with you guys. <laughs> watch ESPN. <laughs> oh man, I love ESPN during Zwift. That's another time. Um, Tay, let me turn that to you. Um, father of four and. Um, um, balancing, you know, family and you have just an awesome, uh, professional role that you, you have up at the U. Um, how do you balance it? What has it done for your life? Yeah. Um, well, I, I love, I love what Jamie said. I, I love, uh, what Dave Sharp said when he was on uh, a few weeks ago, I, I thought he really nailed it on the head. I, I think for me, like, I recently heard this quote and I don't want to, you know, steal up from anybody. I don't know who it was from, but it, it was, it said, uh, uh, starve your distractions and feed your focus. And for me, my four areas of focus are faith, uh, family work and health. And so I feel like if I'm doing something outside of those areas that, 
you know, not that I can't do something outside of those areas, but those four areas take up 90, 95% of my time, if not more, you know? Um, and so I, I think as we <laughs> talk about, you know, how do we balance cycling and family, I'm getting to a point now where I'm starting to blend it, right? Like, and I think a lot of people with older kids are starting to blend and passing on this love of cycling to their kids. So I'm now blending health with family. My son Stockton loves to mountain bike. He came in and watched my Zwift ride on Saturday. It was like, <laughs> dad, dad, they're getting ahead of you. Like, and he sat and like watched for like an hour. So I think, you know, for people like Janie who, you know, have, have a brand new baby. And when I was in grad school and training for an Ironman, I had brand new twins, like, it just is like stupid, right? But you find a way to feed your focus, starve your distractions. And it's just, it's awesome, you know? Whole so. another challenge too. It's like, all right, how can I figure out how to juggle all this? If I want to do all of these things, how am I going to make it happen? And somehow you do. Absolutely. It's so true. Final question for you guys, and we'll turn it over to Stu, but um, you're both successful in, uh, both your training as well as um, your professional careers. What's your advice for all of our listeners tonight? Okay. Go first, no, you go. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I think um, find what motivates you. I mean, every everyone on the team knows that I'm super like, I love to race, you know, I love, and I love to ride, uh, by myself a lot. Like I'm, I'm kind of a loner when it comes to training and that's kind of different for a lot of guys on the team that like to go out and ride in big groups. Not that I don't love that, but I love to be by myself and, and think and ride my bike and sweat a lot on my trainer, which is sounds totally crazy to a lot of people, but like, that's what I love, you know? So just find what works for you, find what works for your situation, like, and, and just roll with it. And, um, I, I just, I just, I love what this group brings as far as the diversity of people that we have. Um, people, some people don't like to race, you know, some people like to just go out and have a good time. And that is totally cool. And I think we just come to appreciate, you know, the different perspectives and backgrounds that everyone has. And that's what makes this so awesome. So that's, that's what I would say. So good. Um, my advice to anyone is just find the most, you know, ambitious goal and go achieve it. I think that people are capable of so much more than they think. And my other piece of advice would be to find a group of people that share this passion for endurance sports that you have. Um, it is so much different training with me Dwelle and these, these people who I absolutely love and getting up at the crack of dawn and conquering a ride and doing it together while you're training for a race. I mean, that is so much different than putting your head down on your trainer by yourself in the basement. I mean, it's necessary and it works. Um, but I get so much joy from being around other people and watching other people succeed around me and feeding off of that. And so I think if you want to get into cycling or if you want to get into Ironman races, like get on a team and find people, because again, like Taylor was saying, you learn so much just from talking to someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can teach you so much and you'll you just have this bond that you can't really explain, but I am my advice is to join me, Dwelly, because <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice. <laughs> Thanks, Jeannie. Stu? Hey, so uh, as we wrap up, I want to know what 2021, what's on the calendar, Taylor? What are you looking oh, man. at? Big year. I think 2020 sucks so bad. I think we're all uh, <laughs> just like so excited. Um, so I, I'm not doing an Ironman this year. I mean, I was signed up for St. George last year and, you know, trained really hard for that. And then when it was canceled, I think in April, I was, I was so demoralized. Mm -hmm. So I've just completely altered my focus to anything on two wheels. So this year I'm doing true grit, the gravel race and then mountain bike back to back. So that'll be gnarly. 
I'm going to do a Tahoe 100K on my mountain bike. Uh, and everything's leading up to Leadville for me this year. So I'm just putting all my, all my, all my works going for a, a sub nine in Leadville. So nice. I'm yeah. all that. Yep. <laughs> Jamie, um, what are you looking at? I know it might be a weird, different year for you, but. <laughs> oh. oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. You can full swing right now. No, no. Brandon's already getting me on the, on the, you know, back on the saddle and oh, boy. planning my race, race year for me. Uh, he's just going to have a little sidekick at the finish line, which will be awesome. But um, I was supposed to do the full Ironman in St. George as well. And then I found out I was pregnant, so I didn't do that. Um so I deferred it to the 70.3. We'll see if I do that, but I really want to focus on, on biking. I think I've learned through Ironman that biking is one of my stronger parts. So I want to try to focus on that. I'll do tour of St. George, definitely going to do Lodija again. And uh, I'll probably do a later season, season half Ironman, just depending on how everything goes with juggling work and everything. And then I'll find other races to do in there, but I want to try to, you know, crush with Kristen at Lodogenics. Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh boy. It's gonna be strong. <laughs> hey, uh, before we wrap up, and and I might get in trouble here, so just keep me. Uh, but you both uh, have spouses that are very prevalent in the sport. Like sometimes we ride with people who the spouse and whatever, they're just like, whatever, you go get out of my hair. I'm like, I don't even want to see you. But uh, both of you, how do you manage that relationship? Just a, like a pointer, a tip. I mean, how do you, how do you uh, approach your spouse when it comes to this kind of stuff? Jane, you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah go I'll ahead. Go first. <laughs> I, I think uh, I, first and foremost, my wife's a saint and I think uh, she loves it equally as much. So it's hard for me to relate to people that have spouses that like, don't understand that. Cause I mean, my wife's probably a better endurance athlete than me. Um, and like, I think we both just feed in and support each other so much. I remember like when I was running my fastest marathon, I called her on my cell phone at mile 20. Cause like I was, I was starting to be like so emotional about it. And like, I knew it was my day and like the one person I want to share it with <laughs> is my wife. That's you awesome. know? So, that like, is so good it's a very unique special bond that I share with her that quite frankly, a lot of folks don't have. And so I'm super, I'm super grateful and super unique with that because there is, my wife has never said to me, like, you don't have time to do that. Or that's a stupid idea. Like she is a hundred percent supportive. So I don't have a lot of advice for those who struggle with that, but I would just say like, you know, find, find that special bond and, and find how it makes your relationship better because it, it can make your relationship better, even if they don't share that love for you. So nice. Um, yeah, Taylor, I love that. I mean, I, I seriously couldn't put it better other than I, you guys all know Brandon and he is just the best mm -hmm. dude. I mean, I don't think you'll find a more loyal companion in life, but he just get so much joy watching me accomplish all these crazy things. And seriously, he's probably signing me up for more than half of my races. Even <laughs> I'm like, I don't really want to do it. And he's like, no, I want you to do it. I mean, he is on board 110%. Anytime I come back from a group ride, which now he'll have a new little, little baby to hold. But anytime I come back from a group ride with me, Dwelle, he's outside with the dogs, like waiting for me to come back and ask me how it was. He's at every finish line. He's, working on my bikes at all times, setting up everything for me. I mean, I am forever grateful to have a partner that supports me as much as he does and loves the sport as much as, you know, I do. And I've gotten him to do two, two half Ironmans. I don't know if we'll get him to do another one. We did a, we did a 70.3 in Coeur d'Alene for our anniversary and it was, it was awesome. But I think that that is key to me doing this sport. Cause I've always said to him that if he ever asked me to not do it anymore, that I would hundred percent not do it. Um, mm -hmm. None of this would be worth it if it was sacrificing my relationship with him. And I don't think he's ever even considered that for one second. It's like more races go out more. And, in, and even since the baby, anytime I've gone out with you guys with me, Dwelle, he's 
done everything he can to rearrange his work schedule so he can come home and watch the baby so I can go out with you guys. And I, I don't see that being a problem in 2021 and he'll be stoked. Until he sees you starting to put that boot, that walking boot on. <laughs> that is that I was really ticked about. That, that is <laughs> right, but story. I was not uh, happy about uh, it. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, uh, you both are very inspiring. I'm very grateful for you as friends and examples. Um, you both lift me and everyone around you, uh, especially with the way that you train, but also like Tay has talked about so much, just your attitudes. Like it's so fun. Uh, Tay and I got to spend such a fun day this year at Loda J together. And I'm not like the, the event itself was fun. It was more fun to just like sneak peeks at him, like laughing at other guys suffering <laughs> just corner of my eye and I'm like yeah and that I mean stuff like that and having those experiences with Janie on long rides it's the same you guys are just um the best to be around which is uh so fun to watch so all right well thank you guys appreciate it and uh we'll see you next time. thanks guys thanks guys you guys are awesome thanks so much